every day I wake up knowing that the more people I try to save, the more enemies I will make. And it's just a matter of time before I face those with more power than I can overcome. I'm so sorry, I'm late. I had a traffic thing. Did your traffic jam have anything to do with being, I don't know, shot at by machine guns? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that was implied. That was implying that. <laughs> you should park. There you are, boy. You're gonna want to see this. Oscorp. Get you under surveillance. Why? Isn't that the question of the day? There's something you're not telling me yet, May. I once told you that secrets have a cost. The truth does too. My name is Richard Parker. I have discovered what Oscorp was going to use my research for. I have a responsibility to protect the world from what I know they're capable of. What is all this? The future. We literally can change the world. What about Peter? Not everyone has a happy ending. bigger than you, Peter. I made a choice. This is my path. So everyone in the city will know how it feels to live in a world without power, without mercy, without Spider-Man. Everybody and welcome once again to Geek Fest Rants. My name is Carlos Perone, and joining me once again in the Tony Rossi bunker, I have Tony <laughs> and Steve Avona. Say hi, gentlemen. Hi, hi gentlemen. gentlemen. We are on location, and the show that we are going to be covering this time around is uh, Marvel Movie Summer. Something like the that. Title you know, of the show is we've. Summer, summer has, Marvel movies. Well, summer has kind of started. We're kind of somewhere around the summer area. There's still more other films to come in the future of this summer, but there's three that we want to kind of touch upon. One of them we already kind of did, but we want to definitely hear Tony's take on it. Because and I would just like to apologize to Tony <laughs> that we did this movie without him. I did it under duress. Oh. Carlos threatened me yeah. and said that if I didn't do this show... Uh, he would do it with someone else. Oh, and, oh. and it said to me that you know we need to do this, and he was accusing me of all kinds. Not of things. only did you do it without me, <laughs> but you invoked my name and, during and the show. The, you know, I mentioned your name, so I want to apologize to Tony for doing a show without him that we really should not. Not only did I mention his name, I used it in a very accusatory fashion. I can't believe Tony yeah. liked this movie. <laughs> So we're going to try and rectify that. Well, that particular movie we're talking about was would be Captain America, The Winter Soldier. We're also going to talk about Spider-Man 2. Spider-Man 2, The Rise of Electro, if you're in Europe somewhere. And we are also going to talk about X-Men, X-Men Days, Days of Future, Future Past. Past. The latest one we just saw, which I have so many questions. Me too. Uh, and I have answers. Good. because Can I ask a question or you, you want to take this in another direction? Well, let's go in order, first of all. Let's the first deal with the controversial issue to of the elephant in the room of Captain America. I remember, if I remember right, when we talked about this film with Steve, how surprised I was at your initial reaction to the film. Which was positive. Which was positive. And the reason why I was surprised is because I remember us talking about a year earlier, maybe. Ironically, I don't remember where I was. And you had to remind me today. Well, who I was. I was. I was exactly in this house <laughs> at that time when we talked about Man of Steel, I think it was. It was Man of Steel. And we were talking about how... Some of these films are so dark. No, and, no, and, and this they, is how you misunderstand and exactly, me and again. How don't understand dark, this guy. And how now, Captain America is more of a uplifting traditional. No, I think you, I defended now, you, Tony. Let the ranting begin. So I was wondering, 
this Captain America was right up my alley in terms of the dark and dreary type of oh, environment. God. And how could Tony possibly like something oh, like that? Let me explain to you. Do you understand you? anything? Let me explain to you. First of all, let me tell you my entertainment choices. Hold on. Let me turn my hearing aid up. Hold on a second. <laughs> Go ahead. My entertainment choices range from Breaking Bad to the Hallmark Channel. So that's a wide group in there. Yes. And as far as Man of Steel goes, I didn't like Man of Steel because the script stunk, I thought. The story was just no good. I didn't think it was executed well. It had no humor to it, no lightness to it. It was just heavy. It wasn't because it was dark, even though, you know, Superman is not a dark character. And the movie kind of turned him dark. Captain America is still the same. Captain America is not a dark character. His environment was darker exactly. in The Winter Soldier, but Captain America is still the Boy Scout who wants, to, who knows what the right roots. thing is and who does the right thing. So that's why your own categorization or your <laughs> misunderstanding of me thinking you I would not like this movie was just completely off base from the beginning because you don't understand people, Carlos. But yes. isn't it unusual to put such a... I don't want to say lighthearted, but such an uplifting character in such a dark environment. Oh, my no. God. Seriously, dude. Are you kidding? They have done this in the comic countless times yeah. where Cap has been up against the government, especially in the 70s. Again, which this movie is kind of paying homage to those sort of conspiratorial thrillers. With Robert Redford. Robert three Redford. Days of the three days of the Condor. But even within the confines of the comic, Cap gave up his identity and became the character of Nomad in a sort of response to the government and the all the shady, Watergate-y things going on in the 70s. So this is not news. This is not a big shock to those of us in the know that Cap has gone against authority when he feels like the authority has been corrupted or is, you know... So he's still being true to his principles. Exactly. He's still a Boy Scout, as Tony said. Again, in this, he remains a Boy Scout. He still does everything that Captain America from the 1940s would do. It's right. just his surroundings changed. Right. And the first one was a much simpler movie. It was just kind of... It was like a good old-fashioned World War II movie where this was a lot more complex... I thought it had a level of humor that Man of Steel didn't have. Yeah. I thought the interplay between Cap and Black Widow was nice and it worked and it they had a and, nice relationship. And Cap and the Falcon. And Cap and the Falcon too. Yeah. Again, there was a lightness to it that Man of Steel just never had. It, it was the dark knightization of Superman and it just didn't you, really you, you work. You don't do that to Superman. It's, it's yeah. Not, it's, and as somebody online I read pointed out, it was almost like, Man of Steel was the opposite of the Avengers. The Avengers, at the end of the Avengers, they're fighting to basically save as many lives as they can. Whereas in Man of Steel, they're just wrecking the city and, and everything. Causing untold millions of deaths. Right. So, I mean, the end of Winter Soldier and the end of Man of Steel are two completely different animals. And I just thought Winter Soldier was a great story, had solid acting all around. It was very heavily based in characters. It wasn't, it didn't overdo the action, which is what I really liked about it. It wasn't just constant one punching scene after another, which again, I felt like Man of Steel was, and I hope Anthony doesn't listen to this show <laughs> and have to hear about it. But man, Captain America was really, there was a lot of just drama in between the action, and that's what I really liked about it. Well, I absolutely love Captain America. And I can't wait till they do the next one. Hopefully they will continue on the storyline because one of the things I mentioned to Steve was I want to see a resolution to the Winter Soldier story because we still don't know what well, happens the Avengers to this guy. will be next. So yes. who knows when that's going to play out? You think they might touch upon this? I, yeah. And, and I mean, again, using the comics as a blueprint, not necessarily as, you know, Bible chapter and verse, but in, and I don't know, Tony, if you're current with at Captain America or even like within the last five years, Captain America. A little. But he, and I think I might have pointed this out in the last show about Cap, but. And I don't think this is necessarily going to happen, but maybe it'll play out in a different way because of contracts and things like that. In the comic, Captain America was killed, killed, always in quotes. And then Bucky slash Winter Soldier, who had already regained his memories and, you know, stopped being a quote unquote bad guy, assumed the mantle of Captain America for quite a few years. And then, you know, Steve Rogers came back and he went back to being the Winter Soldier. But as a good guy and you know i think he teamed up with black widow and i think there might have even been i'm a little sketchy on it but might have been a sort of a love interest thing between bucky and black widow but they're 
you know, they lose their option on Chris Evans after the third Cap and third Avengers. He's fulfilled his six movie contract, whereas Sebastian Stan, who plays the Winter Soldier and also the Mad Hatter on Once Upon a Time, yes. shout out, is option for nine movies and could very well become Captain America. It's just a, a logical place for them to go. And he would probably but, be a little bit darker Captain America uh, than... Probably because of his history and his and Tony background. Tony would just love that. Which, you know, I would be sad to see Steve Rogers or slash Chris Evans not be Cap, but I think he'll be done after six performances. But that's where they could take it. And, um, you know, the comic has already mapped it out for them, so I don't... I don't know if that's going to happen. I have no clue. Winter Soldier, Cap, was my favorite comic book movie of the summer. Having only seen one other, X-Men, which I liked a lot too. (laughs) But out of the two of them, I would give Captain America the edge. Wow. I would agree with Tony uh, saying that having seen three... As much as I liked the other movie that we're going to talk about, I like I give the edge to Cap. And that also might be sort of a nostalgia, sentimental thing, too, because I just he's in my top three. My top three are Spider-Man, Captain America and the Hulk. So, you know, I'll probably edge out on those guys before like liking X-Men or whatever. But I saw Spider-Man. And I hated it. Well, so. let's dive into Spider-Man here. This is the amazing Spider-Man. The not so, so amazing Spider-Man, Spider-Man is Raimi, right? Yes. yes. He was just playing Spider-Man. Yes. And I saw the first one. I liked it. I didn't see the second one yet. So, well, did you think it was inferior, though, to the Raimi films? Um, I kind of just judged it on its own. I didn't compare the two. I thought Peter Parker was more snarky and I thought cocky he was emo but then again, mopey you know well it's uh, kind of for this, kid for this generation I guess. but then again i mean peter parker in the books is kind of a wise ass so well i thought he was a good spider-man but a lousy peter parker okay interesting observation well one of the things see my, my feelings and i can compare them both in terms of first and second i think it was just more the same yeah more of the last one he wasn't worse. He wasn't better. It was just more of the same, basically. A continuation. I actually think that Andrew Garfield as Peter Parker as, and as Spider-Man, I think the performance was better. I'm not so... There are issues I have with other performances in the movie, not so much with his or Emma Stone, who I think is great. Mm-hmm. And I think they have great chemistry, obviously. But what I really have a problem with in terms of this one is the script. And, I mean, you talk about a movie where everything, and I mean everything, hinges on coincidence and happenstance. It's a Three's Company episode. I mean, it's <laughs> it's unbelievable how much one thing has to lead for this to happen, to that to happen, for even for Spider-Man to have come into being, which you find out in... So is this, this deviates from the comic, it sounds like substantially. a lot. Substantially. So, so Spider-Man was almost a deliberate creation? Yeah, not in, deliberate, in but, you know, he's a result of his father's work, mm-hmm. but yet he had to be there on that certain day to, you know, get the spider thing to happen but it all goes back to his father and osborne and all this other stuff and everything that's going to happen is going to flow from osborne in terms of villains Mm -hmm. and i just think it's ridiculous and so kind of hackneyed and trite and i just really you know also to the way they shoehorn harry into the story whereas in the raimi trilogy you know he's there from the start and he, where he belongs. He didn't really take the center stage of villains. The the center stage was Electro, but they didn't really seem to, we didn't really, I mean, Electro. we know that he was a kind of a nerdy, weird scientist, but there really wasn't much to him. It was like. There was nothing to it him. It was like, okay, he's no, there, and there, next, there was, you know. There, there was nothing to Electro. They made you believe that Electro was, Electro was the main well, villain. You, wait, you said there was nothing to Harry. Or there's no, no, no Electro, Electro. Electro. Oh, oh, okay. Harry was. I don't want to say an afterthought, but he maybe he should have been the he main felt villain. felt like an afterthought, and he should have been the main villain. and Or at least tease him for the next one, but don't bring him in the, uh, the, half, the you know, halfway. He feels shoehorned into the yeah. story. And Electro, whereas all the advertising for the film really kind of makes you think that it's going to be Electro, where he's not. And the performance of Jamie Foxx is god awful well some and, people said mm, and, and i agree that he was kind of like the jim the, carrey the jim carrey character he was that that mad scientist type of character the other one was giamani is the i wanted to see more him i'm actually interested in the suit and him discovering the suit or whatever however he ends up with that suit and it's like no he was just here to tease us now right let me tell you about two things that really bothered me in the movie one of them was giamani's russian accent it was such a stereotypically over the top, and Giamani's an excellent actor, 
but he couldn't pull the Russian accent without him sounding like a fool. Yeah. Was the rhino originally a Russian in the comic? I don't remember yeah, that. Yeah, he was. was he? But And he even has on the shoulder like a Russian star and everything, the, the rhino But you know, in the, in the comic, they always kind of made him like your sort of typical thug. Yeah. Like you didn't get the sense that he had a Russian accent, even though he had a Russian but name. But in the comic, was it a mechanical suit? No. I remember seeing some cartoon where he's... Yeah, a, they're playing off of the ultimate version of the Rhino. You know, there's the ultimate line of comics, yeah. which is sort of a much more modernized version of a lot of these characters. Like Mecha Godzilla. Yeah. <laughs> so it's that. The movies, what they do is they kind of sort of pick and choose from either the classic Marvel universe or the ultimate Marvel universe for whatever works best for the film. And I guess that's what they chose for the Rhino because they thought probably thought like a guy in a suit would look stupid. The other uh, thing that I don't I also don't like the way they even though a lot of people complained about the way the Green Goblin looked in the Raimi film, I much preferred that to the way he looked in yeah, the didn't uh, bother me too Mark much. Webb I mean, film. The other thing that bothered me, and, and I know this is there's nothing we can do about it because I understand it's part of the character, is all the little jokes that Spider-Man throws at people as he's fighting them. All the, yeah. hey, look at this. Oh, I didn't expect that one. Woo-hoo-hoo, you know, well, that well, kind of how, stuff. I mean, that's kind of true to the and, character. And, and even the last, I know the last, the, even the Raimi had those type of little puns and, and, and yeah. little sayings, but it just kind of brought me out of the realism here we go we're talking about realism well, no here. you want it when you're watching a movie you want to be invested in that world whether it's realistic realistic or not it has to be realistic for what you're seeing in front of you so yeah, well, you but, don't yeah, want to be shaken out of it but i'm talking yeah. about but, but from what i understand it's it's in the comic it's everywhere the the little jokes he throws that's how he well, is yeah that's how he is you watch any of the even the animated stuff from whatever the 60s the 80s the 90s that's who he is and that bothered you yeah, it bothered me more than last time for some reason. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, so you didn't like this movie too much? I didn't dislike it, but I didn't like it. I didn't love it. It was like, okay, I got my two hours. I, I got two to hours go now. and 20 minutes. It yeah, was it too was long. Pretty long. It was, yeah, it was pretty long. I would also say, you know, we're, you know, spoiler alert. I wasn't really that excited for the film based on how I felt about the first one, but I did want to see how the Gwen Stacy storyline was going to play out. I wanted to know, number one, were they going to kill her? And number two, was it going to follow the comic or was it going to sort of be an homage to the comic? And was it going to have that emotional heft to it that it did in the comic? And I will say this, this is probably the only sort of positive feeling that I got out of the movie, is that they had done such a good job with establishing the Peter-Gwen relationship, which is something that, I mean, the way they handled Gwen Stacy in the Raimi trilogy was just an afterthought, Mm. shoehorning her into the movie, because they obviously decided that the Mary Jane relationship was the more contemporary and the one that people would remember. But, you know, they rebooted it, and obviously they want to differentiate it, so they brought in Gwen, and they did have that great relationship, that great rapport, and she did die pretty much the same way she died in the comic. I was like, wow, you know, it, it was done well. It had a sort of, it had emotional weight to it. You know, I, I did feel for Peter when it happened. And Did you like Gwen as a character I better did. than Peter? I liked Gwen. I liked Garfield slash as Peter better in this film because I thought he was less of a douche, to be honest with you, <laughs> than okay. he was in the first one, that he had sort of grown a little, and I liked his That was on the advertisement, less of a douche, yes. Steve Avona. Yes. Oh, right under Newsweek. But the conventions of the script are what really killed the film for me, so I would compliment Garfield on his performance. I would compliment Emma Stone. I would say that Jamie Foxx was bad. Dane DeHaan, who I think is a good actor, and I liked the film Chronicle that he was in uh, very much, and I think he could have been a good Harry if the material was there, Mm -hmm. but the material was not there, and just the, the sort of journey that he's supposed to go on towards hating Peter. Too quick. Too quick, and not the way it should have played out. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's, again, my argument always with these films is the farther away you stray from the source material, the shakier ground you're on. And I think that if it's done right and done well in the comic, you should sort of adhere to it generally, not mm-hmm. chapter and verse, but generally, because people love that and it, and it's sort of iconic. So in this uh, movie, Harry is the Green Goblin Harry who winds up green. killing Harry kind kills of... Gwen. Harry is the Goblin. His father, you know, the whole aspect of being the Goblin is more of a genetic thing and I don't know if that's part of the ultimate version of the goblin because I don't read the ultimate comic. Well, who's the guy at the end that visits him who do you think well that's that like this shadowy dude who was at the end of the first one 
We don't know who he is. Oh, okay. He's like an Oscorp guy who's like this mysterious guy in the background. And that's another thing I don't like is that they're sort of, they were setting up the Sinister Six movie, which in all honesty might not happen with the box office performance that mm. Spider-Man is giving. I mean, Spider-Man 3 will probably happen, but they may just scrap Sinister Six. Quick question, Spider-Man 3, <clears throat> the fact that we see in Oscorp the, that chamber with all these right. weapons and we see two things that we hadn't seen during the movie and that is what looks like to be Doc Ox arms, arms the and then wings. some wings. Right. You think those are next characters or just there well, to Well, there would be the Vulture the, and, and Doc, Doc Ock. Yeah. But they're setting you up and I think also they set up Craven, the hunter, maybe. But they are setting you up more so for the Sinister Six, not Spider-Man 3. It's like the more villains you have, it's like the worse the movie gets. Well, and uh, yeah, that's true. Well, that's what but happens also, to the old too, Batman films. How do you have a movie with all villains? I mean, again, somebody has to be the protagonist versus the antagonist. And is it a movie about bad guys being bad or is it a movie about bad guys maybe doing the right thing despite themselves? I don't know what the hell the plan is for that. And it's just, to me, sounds like a cash grab for Sony because as we talked about off mic, Sony and Fox, they have their rights to their little Marvel pools and they want to maximize their profits and they see how well Marvel's done with their shared universe. Fox might be able to do it more because X-Men is a lot more diverse and they have Fantastic Four also, but but Sony has Spider-Man and they want to make the, the you can't build the so-called cinematic universe around one character and his rogues gallery. Mm. I think it's a big mistake, and but as, I don't know. As a comparison to what we were talking about before, Captain America and Winter Soldier, there was really only one villain in that movie. And you could say Hydra was the main villain. And the Winter Soldier, who wasn't even in it that much. It's not the villain. It didn't really focus That's on the villain so That's what we talked so about, much. that it's really Robert Redford. The, yeah, the, yes, the, the big villain. baddie. He's the villain. And he's developed, <laughs> as opposed to you have the Rhino, you have... Electro, you have the Green Goblin. It's like it, just try to throw everything in, which which half was, was more streamlined right. of a movie, and that was what sunk the Raimi trilogy. Was you know even though I liked and the Sandman, Burton tri- and, and the Burton, Burton films, films too. slash Schumacher films, and they went crazy with you know baddies. in the Raimi films, the studio made him put Venom in the last film. He just wanted it to be Sandman, and Thomas Hayden Church was great. But then he shoehorned Venom into it, and the whole movie implodes. And I mean, not just because of Venom, but You know, that was a big factor. And, you know, one hero, one villain. Spider-Man, Green Goblin. Spider-Man, Doc Ock. Batman, Joker. You know, I mean, yes. Did did you have Two-Face in Dark Knight? Which, and that character I thought was unnecessary. Let's put it this way. I liked it. I didn't think it detracted. No. I think there was a validity to having Mm -hmm. Two-Face in that Batman film. He served a purpose. He served a very important purpose. He linked things. Yeah. He made connections. So I didn't sort of think of that in terms of like the other films. He wasn't like Two-Face in the Burton film. Just a color. color Yeah, Two-Face in Riddler. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, so, so... I think Sony is just really self-destructing with their Spider-Man films. And these studios who, again, I give them all the credit because if it wasn't for Fox doing X-Men and Sony doing Spider-Man, that laid the groundwork for Marvel to have their own studio, to do their own films. And Marvel has become more successful than them. And they want, they're going to keep rebooting so they can keep the rights to the characters and just drive it into the ground. Rebooting series too quickly and just, again, cash grabs. Mm. Top notch special effects, very good actors, but. but eh, eh, okay. When you see what Marvel is doing, you know, Marvel yeah, Studios yeah. is doing, they have the blueprint. But this is, I guess, a good segue into Fox. I think they're doing a good job with X Men, which is also a rebooted in a sense. Well, it's then again, no, it's, it's just a different. Yeah, well, you're right. It's, it's funny not, because well, now it's rebooted. It's rebooted if <laughs> it's you think re-boot- about it. Because yeah. well, yeah. because now if you look at, I was reading something online. <sighs> Basically, X Men two and three didn't happen. Mm-hmm. X Men might have happened, but two and three <sighs> definitely didn't happen. It's it's you know it's really and I mean really to me. To me, as as, as <laughs> like I don't care. Like I enjoyed them. So the this fact is, that in like in, into darkness in, uh, in, territory oh, we're don't going even here. Shut up. Stop talking. <laughs> uh, That's a Star Trek reference. Yeah, right? um, it's when you you know it's change o- time. It's okay mm. with me what they did with X Men. I don't feel like oh didn't happen now. No, you know Wolverine remembers it, so it happened. Well, let's well, talk let about me... this a little bit in terms of what are your this questions? Is, this let, is let Days me... of Future Past. What is this story about? Where to come from? Wait, wait, wait. Oh, oh, I can tell before you. Before you even get to that. All right. Well, all right. No, go ahead and answer his question. <laughs> for me too. Okay. 
Days of Future Past is a classic two-part. Is it old or new? Or? Oh, yeah. Old, it's 30 old. years old. 80s. 81 or Chris two. Chris Claremont. John Byrne. One of the most well-remembered, revered stories in X-Men lore. Basically, it is... Um, and the movie follows the spirit yes. of, of the story. <laughs> not, again, not chapter and verse. In the comic, Kitty Pride goes back in time to her younger self to uh, warn the X-Men that this character, not Bolivar Trask who in the movie, it's uh, Senator Robert Kelly, who who has been in the X-Men movies, is going to be assassinated. Was he the senator from the first yeah, X-Men film? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Is going to be assassinated by Mystique and the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, not just Mystique. Okay. And they need to avert this from happening. And what you have in the comic, as with the movie, is you have two stories being told. You have the story, and again, they build a machine that enables her to do this. It's not that Kitty Pride has Good. this power. She can just phase through walls. That's her power. But she goes back to the X-Men and tells them this is going to happen, and they, you know, they avert this from happening, and it's again, it's playing out. The future story is playing out as the Sentinels are killing the X Men. You know, she needs to succeed in time before they're all killed in the future. So again, the movie sort of plays out. You know, along you know, two stories being told simultaneously, just like the comic, but instead of Wolverine being sent back. It's Kitty Pride, it's okay, and and sort of the way they sort of paid homage to that in the movie is they made Kitty the one, the vessel the through conduit. which Wolverine, the <laughs> conduit mm-hmm. through which Wolverine is able to go back in time, and it also makes sense for it to be Wolverine. For well, it to, he's a big character. He's the big character, and yeah. he doesn't age, mm-hmm. so he can look the same. Uh, and he's Hugh Jackman. He's Hugh Jackman, and, and he's you the get most to see, popular and you get character. To see his butt. And you see his tiny. Oh, unnecessary. Did your wife yeah. go to see this one? No. You should. Uh, she won't watch X-Men. All right. Like, all right. Move it on. So, <laughs> so, yeah. So, I mean, if that's your backstory. Well, this brings us to the end of part one of our superhero movie summer. Please join us again next week where we will continue diving deeper into X-Men Days of Future Past. And we'll also take a quick little peek at Guardians of the Galaxy and Ant-Man. So I'd like to thank Tony and Steve for joining me and come back next week where we will continue this conversation. So on behalf of everybody here, thank you for listening and we'll see you soon at GeekFest Rants. Bye-bye, everybody. On November 22nd, 1963, President John Kennedy was critically wounded. Shortly after the events in Dealey Plaza, in a secret trial, Eric Lencher was found guilty of first-degree murder and conspiracy to assassinate the President of the United States. However, the evidence against the mutant called Magneto remains circumstantial. An amateur photograph of Lencher on the grassy knoll and the rounds fired from a rifle. According to a recently declassified report from the Warren Commission, Lencher altered the trajectory of Oswald's second bullet, effectively murdering the president. But even half a century after the assassination, the events of November 22nd continued to be the source of controversy. Why would Eric Lencher murder the president? How was the gunman Lee Harvey Oswald involved? And what hard evidence is there to confirm that Magneto manipulated the infamous Bent Bullet? Find out more at thebentbullet.com. I did it under duress. Carlos threatened me. Hello? Stop. It's just one that, like, summer blockbusters be catered to 13-year-old chicks.